song? All right. So let's go ahead and do that, and then I'll have Mike come. All right, let's all stand. Grab your songbook. We're going to turn to number 128 in the sweet by and by. Let's sing it out. Prepare our hearts for some preaching tonight. Number 128. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare. Great singing, you may be seated. Amen, it is great singing. All right, um, let me give you a, uh, just a word of testimony. Um, so, uh, if you didn't see this, I, I, I've become friends with um, the pastor of Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church. His name is Jack Young, and I really didn't know him up to probably earlier this year. I've known of him. He's been the pastor there for four years in Webster. I've known of the church. And we've hit it off great. And so he said, uh, I want you to come on my podcast. It's called Pastoral Thoughts. And I said, no. I said, I'm not going on there. I said, I don't have anything to share. I said, what do you, you, know, what do you want me to say? I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. So he kept pressing me a couple of times. He said, no, really, I want you to come on, and I'll lead you, and you just tell your story. So Tuesday, I did a, this podcast. So glory to God, it came out um, amazingly well in that he just asked, tell us, you tell me your story. When did you get saved? Where was your training? And he led me with great questions right into, you know, starting the church here and everything. And what he did, he said, my job is to make you look good. What he did is he made our ministry look great. All right, so I didn't want you to know that. It's on my Facebook feed. It's probably out there somewhere on YouTube. Um, but uh, anyway, it was a blessing. But, but I say that to say, you guys, this church makes that easy for me to be able to brag on. It really does. It's amazing. I didn't get into all of this, but I will give your numbers. You know, we, had, we, we have the most we've ever received in offerings. I think we're up to about 500 and. Eighty thousand dollars, something like that, that 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 have come in this year. We gave away um, a record high of over eighty thousand dollars from benevolence and missions and all those other things. Um, probably close to fifteen percent. I bet we gave away. We probably have. I'm going to guess again, just conjecture. I bet you we're close to four hundred thousand in the bank. Um, so we brought in a lot. We spent a lot, we gave away a lot, and we saved a lot. I like that balance. I love that balance. But that's because of your generosity. So anyway, here, here's, a, here's a quick snapshot of, of just how the Lord is so good to us, right? So we ended up giving out, first it was 18000 and then I added one more uh, person. 
we ended up giving out in, in, in a two week window $21,000 to help families, okay? So the last two offerings of the year, we average $11,000 a week in offerings, which is, again, the most ever, $11,000. So the first week we get an offering, I told you, of $19,000. That's a surplus of $8,000. Last Sunday, we had a record high offering. I don't know what happened. $24,000. That's a surplus of $13,000, which equals a surplus of $21,000, which is exactly what we gave away. So I look at that and I say, thank you, Lord. You know, it's just the Lord, his hand, just continuing to be on the ministry and blessing the way that he's blessed. So anyway, I say that it's, it's easy for me to brag on this ministry. And I take, I, I take zero credit for it. So I, I just, I brag on you people and I appreciate you. Um, so tonight I asked Mike Brader to come preach because tonight is one of those weeks where I can get him in because there's no Awana. And I want to make, be able to make sure he gets a, a chance to preach. And this is a perfect week for him to do that. All right. So um, and then um, next Thursday, back to our routine of Awana. And uh, I'll be back in the series of Judges uh, next week. I think we're in chapter nine. So. But Mike, I know he'll be well prepared. Mike and Lucy, there's two things that I don't worry about in this church, and it's because they run them both. One, I don't worry about the Awana ministry. Self-run, I don't think about it much uh, as far as concerns or anything like that, and that's because it's in great hands with them. The second is the Saturday cleaning crew that they've been doing since they've been in this church, heading that up. I'm not concerned about that getting done because of them. But that's the quality people and leadership that they are. And I know Mike uh, loves the Word of God, loves to study the Word of God, and I know he'll be a blessing to us tonight. So, Mike, thank you for uh, agreeing to preach tonight. I appreciate it. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Everybody, Pastor. Oh, man. Hope everyone had a, a very nice Christmas. Walking into the New Year, this is the time of the year where you just kind of really don't know what day it is. Um, if I wasn't uh, preaching tonight, I probably wouldn't have known that it was Thursday. Just kind of everything blending together. But that had a, a wild year. I know it was tough on a lot of people. It was great for us. Had a uh, we, we welcomed our our second child this year, um, so it was a pretty pretty good for, year for us all in all. Um, next thing I got coming up, uh, I got a turn of 35 in a couple weeks. And you know, I used to get questions all the time uh, pertaining to my relationship with pastor. It'd always be, um, are you pastor's son? Are you his nephew? But the last couple times lately, um, the question was, are you, are you pastor's brother? <laughs> And so, Pastor, you don't look a day older than 35. So. Oh, man. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 11. We're going to be in Genesis 11. And, you know, I, I did, I, I, as soon as I saw that podcast go up, I, I watched it today. It, it was a blessing. Um, I just love hearing uh, how ministry works. I love hearing about successful ministries and being a part of it. And um, I never knew really what went into a ministry and all the things that, had to happen and, and all the work that really goes behind it, uh, your pastor works very hard uh, to make this successful. As much as he uh, tries to give credit elsewhere, he works very hard um, to make this work here. So uh, we're in Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to read the first nine verses, then we'll pray, and then we'll see what we got. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. 
Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for this opportunity. God, I just pray that you uh, bless these words. I pray that they're pleasing to you. Pray that they're acceptable to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so again, uh, we are in, uh, in chapter 11, verse 1. It says the earth was one language and one speech, and that's repeated again in verse 6. It says that they, the people is one, and they have all one language. We're going to focus on that repeated idea here. Whenever the Bible starts repeating something, it's usually there for emphasis. It's something that it wants you to, uh, that God wants you to see. And it says here that the people were one. It says that the whole earth was one language, one speech. The Lord says one language, and this unity uh, eventually is going to lead them into rebellion against the Lord, and ultimately is going to be judgment from God. They're going to be their language is confounded, and they're going to be split up. So we're going to look at the ways that the world is one against God. We're going to look the way the world is one against God, and some warnings for us uh, to not uh, take on those characteristics. Now, unity isn't in itself a good or evil thing, but it's rather uh, what you're unified about, what you, uh, what brings you together, what motivates you, what everybody gets together for. Um, being growing up playing sports, I always think of sports when you have a, a championship winning team. They interview the winning team and they say, yeah, we, were all, we all had each other's backs. We were all there for each other. We pushed each other. They all bought into the system and they just, they, they were unified. Typically, you see that you don't you don't have a team that uh, is is this dysfunctional winning the championships usually in this you know whatever you can see the benefit of unity or oneness when you have a group of people trying to achieve a common goal that's not a bad thing all people pulling in the same direction will yield the best results that's just a fact in uh, relationships um, I'm married to Lucy and, and we are unified. In our inch, are we unified tonight? Are we? We're good. We're unified tonight. Uh, we are. We, we have common interests. Uh, we like to go to the same places and do the same things, eat the same types of food, uh, watch the same TV shows, all those kind of things. We have a oneness uh, that brings us together, that connects us, and it helps us achieve our goals. But more importantly than those things, we are. Uh, one in our philosophy of life, uh, of going to church, uh, Bible reading, uh, Bible doctrine, how to raise our family. We have had many conversations on how to do that and what we would like to achieve. Those are things that we are together about. Um, and that, hopefully, that would yield the best results for us. And, you know, this it's the same thing here in Christianity. The Bible, over and over again, calls for unity of the believer um, on several occasions, but it's always that unity is always centered on Jesus Christ and the things of God. All right, so we can't just come to church and be unified about some uh, central point other than Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be unified when we come together. Ephesians four three says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and, and in you all. And so there's really not room for anybody else. Um, it's all Jesus Christ. That's the reason we're supposed to come together. We're supposed to be one, but that one that we model is Jesus. We cannot be one without taking on the nature and mind of Jesus Christ first. The attributes of God are supposed to be what brings us together. I think of 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You cannot have fellowship one with another if you're not walking together in Jesus Christ. If one is walking with Jesus and one is not, there is no fellowship there. You could still be saved, but you will not have fellowship together. So we have here in this passage, what we have is unity, but it's against God. In Genesis 9-1, uh, you remember uh, Noah and the flood. God commands Noah and his three sons. He commands them to spread out and to multiply and to replenish the earth. And here, 
Um, Genesis chapter 10 is basically just all genealogy, and the, and, the, and the story picks up here in chapter 11. It says here in verse 3, we're going to make us that they're going to go make a city. Let us go. We, the people are one in purpose. And that purpose is that they're united against God. Again, in verse 3, it says, Go to, let us make brick. Let us, verse 4, let us build a city and a tower. Let us make a name, and then lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They don't want to be uh, scattered abroad. They're going to build a city. They're going to build, build a tower to reach heaven, and they want to make a name for themselves. God commanded them to spread out, and they said, we're going to stay here. That was their purpose. Their purpose was to rebel against the commandment of God. At this point, this is only the third generation from the flood, one or two hundred years maybe. They had firsthand knowledge of the world before the flood. They could have sat down and talked to their grandfather and asked him about what the world was like. They could have asked him how God dealt with it, what the, what the flood was like. They had a firsthand account of what the flood and the judgment of God was. And they decided that they were going to not follow God's commandment. Evidently, they didn't like it, that design to spread out. And they congregated together. In verse 2, it says... Uh, as they journeyed from the east, they, that they found a plain, they dwelt there. Apparently, they liked each other. You have this entire earth. There wasn't that much population yet in that amount of time. And they could have gone anywhere they wanted to, with anybody they wanted to. I'm going to promise you right now, if I don't like you and I have the entire earth to travel, I'm not traveling with you. <laughs> Just the way it goes. I would not be interested so these people are going to establish their city. They, they've got a purpose together. They are one mind. They have no problem traveling together. The concept of building a city should not go unnoticed here. It's no coincidence that the first kingdoms, the first cities built, uh, Babel included, these were named in scripture connected with Nimrod. He was a type of the Antichrist. He's the founder of the religion of Baal. Um, and he builds this city, and he, or he's associated with this city, um, and it's, it's beliefs, it's values, it's, it's all about rebellion against the Lord. Make it a name for yourself. It's pride, it's arrogance. This, this is a declaration to the Lord that they deserve to be in heaven where he is. We're going to build a tower to heaven. And not only that, we're going to get there our own way. They're going to build their own Mount Olympus and establish, establish themselves as God. Now look what they do here again. It says that let us make brick. And it says they had brick for stone. You know, stone is what God created. And brick is what man created. Brick is made from mud and straw and water. And it's cheap. You can do it anywhere as long as you got mud and water. And it always, uh, it's, it's cheap labor to employ. It's not an easy thing, but it's, anybody can do it um, as long as you have someone willing to do it. It's not like a stone uh, mason where it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a skilled thing. It's a cheap option. And it doesn't last, as, it could last a long time, but it doesn't last very long. You know, that's a, this is a lot like the religion of Baal or other false religions in scripture. They pop up constantly and they're a cheap religion. They're everywhere um, and there's no moral requirements. There's no skill involved with it. Anybody can be a priest. Anybody can be a worshiper. There's nothing that you have to give up to do it. The city and its high place reflect the purpose of the people. It's to replace God with their own God. Now, Christians, we can get kind of like this when uh, we start to build up. I talked about building a family. If I start building my city according to my values and what I see, um, it can be you can start building your own Babel. You got to be careful. The world can be made better only through Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that that's what we're building on. A lot of problems that the Christians have is their purpose wrongly. Uh, they, they go through life, I want to give my child a better life. Um, I'm just going to ignore consequences. I'm going to love everybody, all those things, um, which is not bad to love somebody, but it's, there, there has to be discretion with how, it, how it's done. A Christian's responsibility is not to set up God's kingdom on earth. It's to point people to the spiritual kingdom. Although that idea is coming back, every, they, they cycle, the, the post-millennials back around again. 
But listen, Jesus is going to set up his own throne, and we're going to follow after that. So it's very easy to get into setting up a building that reflects our values, and that can spill over into into society. And what I'm talking about tonight a lot of is going to be um, what's creeping into churches, which is the social gospels. And that's a problem for us. It's not something that we can just ignore, in my opinion. All right, so we're supposed to get saved out of this world. We're not really going to make this world a better place. This world's going to uh, turn on itself, and the Lord's going to end it, and he's going to build his own city. Now, what are we supposed to focus on? God's city is built with gold, silver, precious stones through Jesus Christ. When you look at Revelation 21, the city of New Jerusalem, the Bible identifies that as the bride of Christ. That's us. It's described with golden streets, and its foundations and its walls has every type of precious stone uh, that you could think of. There is no mud brick mentioned in, Genesis, in, in Revelation 21. It's not there. The mud brick is the earthly things. The gold and the silver and the precious stones, those are the eternal things. Those are, those are what we're supposed to build with. And we like to build our life with things that don't last forever. You know, we spend a lot of time focusing on our child's professional baseball career, your own career, um, family time on Sunday morning instead of going to church. Maybe, you know, Christmas is on Saturday, so I'm not going to church on Sunday. Next year it's on Sunday, and we're going to have service on Sunday, I believe. So um, we like to build our life on things that don't last forever. Going to church, that's going to that's gonna pay off forever. The building material of God is done through Jesus Christ. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I just wanted to refer to it quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 10. The Bible says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. How he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that 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 is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. And so... What that passage is going to tell us is a few things. One, you need to take care of how you build, of how you build. What is the purpose? Uh, Gold, silver, precious stones, those things. There's a great study when you go through Scripture of what gold, silver, and precious stones uh, can mean for our rewards. Um, But we know for a fact that the wood, hay, and stubble, those those things are just things you do here, and they're going to burn up, and they're going to go. They don't matter. They only matter here. So what is the purpose of your build? And why are you building what you're building? Does it bring value to God? You know, we're supposed to be one in service for God. We're not supposed to be building a better world. We're not supposed to be building a better future for our our children. Great thing to do. Plan for your children. Provide for your children. But that should not be the only thing you worry about in this life. There's more. You, know, we, you look at things like uh, the critical race theory and the may we be one gospels. Listen, they're false gospels. They don't belong in Christianity. They don't belong in the church. Right. Make no mistake. These are not aimed at government. They're not aimed at society. Those things are aimed at scripture and they're aimed at those that believe the scripture. Because that's what they fight against. There is no personal accountability allowed. There is no forgiveness of the individual allowed under those Gospels. And the the Bible already teaches, it already gives answers to the problems that these heresies try to bring up. The Bible says there is no division of race in the body of Christ. It says in Revelation chapter, uh, I think it's 7. I didn't write it down. I think it's Revelation chapter 7. It says there's a multitude of every nation, every tongue. Every one. The Bible says we're supposed to treat each other like brother, sister, father, and mother. It doesn't have anything about race in there. Now the people in Shinar, they built with cheap. They built with the brick, the mud. 
And God, and I also didn't mention this, they built with the slime too, but I didn't have anything for the slime. But God builds with eternal value. Does your purpose reflect what the world values? Social equality, safety at all costs, being entertained, building a better life for your kids. Or does it reflect the things of eternal value? God's value. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering, faith, meekness, temperance. Are those things in your life? Those are what's supposed to be in our life. That's what we're supposed to be building together. The people were one in purpose against God. They traveled together, they built together, and they rebelled together. The second way the people were one against God is in their language. In their language. God mentions in verse 6 that they have one language. All one language. They all talk the same. They're able to communicate what they want. They all agree that the words they're saying are good. They're good words. It's very important uh, that this language, this one language that they, all, that they all could understand each other, God mentions it twice. This is something they had going for them. This was a positive thing for that group. It kept them together. And it is what God used to confound them, is to, to divide them. It was obviously important. Language, everyone's speaking the same way. Listen, speech is a big deal for the cause of unity. It's not necessarily, again, good or bad. It's how it's used. It can be used to rally and to encourage people to move for good or for evil. And it, it has been the primary tool of motivation since the beginning. You look at Adam and Eve right from the beginning. They walked with God. He was called the voice of the Lord in the garden. They walked with the voice of the Lord. And the disruption of the words of God led to the broken fellowship between God and man from Satan. Speech and language is one of those things that makes a church service effective. The preacher preaches, the hearers hear. We have a church language that unites us. There are just certain words in church atmosphere that people know. If you've been in church at any point, it's any amount of time, you just know them. You've heard the term fellowship. That's been talked about many times. You know the term, the body of Christ. Um, that's unique to Christianity. If you say those things outside of a Christian, outside of a church narrative, people are like, what are you talking about? If people come in, they go, I don't understand. They're not part of it. We have a language that brings us together. At Faith Bible, we say a lot around here, we say in simplicity, in godly sincerity. That's, our, that's how we want to run our ministries. That's how, the, that's how Pastor would... As he pushes that often. Is it as simple as it can be? Sometimes we're doing things where it just can't be simple. I understand. But it's simple and godly sincerity. He says all the time, you've heard it up here a lot, an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit. That's something that is unique to, well, not maybe not unique, but it's something that we say here a lot at Faith Bible Church. These words give us an identity that are unique to us. And they give us a sense of belonging, that we belong here. We're part of the family here. We're united. That's good. The King James Bible, among many other things, brought unity to the English language. It established the way words would be spelled or, way, or the way phrases would be used in the English language from the time it was printed. People will go, how did the Bible spell it? That's how we're going to spell from now on. That's a good thing. Unity in language, again, isn't inherently right or wrong. It's how it's used. That means we really ought to be guarding our minds and our hearts as to what is being spoken around us. You're associated with what you listen to, and even more so by what you say. When I was at Liberty University, that's where I, I met Lucy, um, you would hear all the time, if it's Christian, it ought to be better. And I love that statement. If it's Christian, it ought to be better. Basically, you, you better find the best way to do it um, if you're going to represent it. It's just one of those things that you would hear there all the time. Language and communication is what unite a people. Uh, I took a Spanish class in high school. My brother was in there. Uh, my teacher, Senora Montañez, she was from Puerto Rico. And she spoke fluent Spanish. I did not. And so she would do this thing where she would start speaking very slowly. 
and I could pick out each individual word. But as we went, she would start picking up speed. And by the time she finished her sentence, all I heard was one 47-syllable word. I did not hear what she said. We didn't speak the same language. I don't know what she said. I don't know how I passed that class. I really don't. I just stared at her, completely lost. And you know what? You know when you don't speak the same language. You know when you don't. And you know what the language today, the language today is, unfortunately, it's hate. That's the language of the world today. And they tie it up and they, they present it as acceptance of, of trying to get everybody in. But it's not what it is. You can shout and spout all you want about peace and prosperity for all, but the language is hate against God. That's what it is. It's because people love darkness rather than light. People are united in hate speech against God. I look at the nation of Israel. They've been so often under attack. Um, if you've heard of the Iron Dome, just an amazing uh, technology that is there that protect. It's, it's working constantly, and it protects both Israelis and Palestinian residents from rockets launched across borders. The world hates Israel for being God's chosen people, and they hate everything they do. If you read how they are presented in these attacks, they always the news coverage is always about how Israel instigates the fight, how they bomb innocent targets, how they're intolerant of the Islamic presence there. But that's really not the truth. They are protecting everyone that's under that iron dome, Israeli or not. But it's been repeated and repeated and repeated. That speech is powerful. And now I've, I've seen videos of young Christians that are wondering, what do we have to do with Israel? I don't understand why we're giving them, why we're helping them, why we support them. Now I understand Israel isn't uh, where they should be with the Lord, but they are still God's chosen people. When a Christian spends most of their day around the unsaved and does nothing to cleanse the mind or charge the spirit, we're going to sell out the important things like our Bible reading, like Bible believing like discipleship, like church attendance. Those things will just become, you know, why am I doing those? They take a lot of effort. i got to get up early. Why am I going to do that? You need to be careful with what you're doing. You need to be careful what you're listening to. We've folded to the pressure to look like the world to attract it. I, I, I don't understand it, but that's where we're at. Christianity has this thing where they want to look like the world, to bring in the world, to attract the world, but then they don't give them anything when they're there because there's nothing different. This shift in mission is through the repetition of speech. It's telling you what is so, and it's telling you, uh, and then what they're doing is they're replacing the commands of God. And, and listen, it's coming from the pulpits. That's really the problem I'm having here. It's coming from the pulpits. I don't understand why churches are giving place to advocates of critical race theory. I don't understand why churches are giving uh, place to uh, women being pastors, no offense to anyone in here. That's not biblical. Why are, there, why are we watching those podcasts and those YouTube videos? Listen, we don't need to hear sin explained to determine whether or not it's good. God has already defined these things. In the Bible, you will find homosexuality, adultery, drunkenness, those that will cause division from the Bible doctrine itself, those are all labeled as sin and abominations. We don't have to hear about them from those perspectives to tell if they're, if they're sinful or not. They should not be in our church. They're not in our church from the pulpit. The language of tolerance has led churches into foolish things like I've seen several churches in, in Christians participating in Things like Ash Wednesday. That's not, that's not a Bible doctrine. Yeah. Reaching out to other religions and calls of unity. Christianity is not unified with other religions. The, result, they, the, the, the core of Christianity is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one way. There is no other alternative there. In a recent set of interviews I watched, um, the humanitarian organization World Vision... Um, they focus. They, they do a lot of. They do a lot of good work. They really do. And so this isn't a knock on World Vision, the whole thing. But there is a part of World Vision, 
in which they have tried to reach out to other, um, they've tried to reconcile with other religions. They have a we are one course. And what they are teaching is that we need to be more mindful of the American Indian religion specifically. One supposedly Christian Native American said this about the COVID interruption for churches. Just as an example, I can go outside in the mornings to pray with my cornmeal. I can take part in those ceremonies, those smoke ceremonies, and the things like that I grew up doing. It's just that there was so much outside influence that tells us as Native people that it's pagan. She continues on and says, I appreciate the time I've had to spend with my grandkids and explain to them, you're related to all parts of creation, even weather. Those are your relatives. That's pagan. That's pantheism. That is relating the Lord God creator to his creation. And that's in a, in a supposed Christian organization. That's like being a Buddhist, being, being a, a Buddhist being saved and saying, but I'm still going to pray to Buddha. <laughs> you can't do that. In a panel discussion about anti-racist worship and song, one participant her name was Cheryl Baird. Apparently, she's a songwriter of Christian music. I, I looked up some of her music. I didn't know any of it. But apparently, she's written a lot of music. And this is what she had to say about why she writes uh, music. In most of the churches, I never deal with anything that touches my indigenous soul. So nothing that I see, none of the artwork, none of the music, it's all not about me. If you're coming to church for you, to make it about you, then you're not coming to church for the right reason. In another panel, I watched a president of a Christian college. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't catch his name. But he talks about that he wrote an uh, article and presented it to his church about using the term darkness in hymns and why that is racist. And the church members responded, well, it's a biblical term. And he was upset with that. It is a biblical term. And it's not a racial term. These are just a few of the examples of the infiltration of the church body. I understand that, listen, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. I understand that. However, it can prevail against you, an individual. It can prevent, prevail against a local church. You have to be on guard for these things. I saw a video from Jen Johnson. She is the co-pastor of the Bethel Music Church or whatever it is. Um, this whole thing was a, a compilation of her talking about the Holy Spirit. And her take on the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is like the genie from Aladdin. And he's blue. And he's silly. And he's sneaky. This woman is writing Christian music played in churches. Now listen, if she gets anything right, I can get it right from somebody else. What is in your house? I'd look. I would absolutely look. Why is this important? Because the battle is no longer somewhere else. It's no longer across the seas. It's no longer in some crazy religion. It's in the church. I, have, I had a million other examples, but I just couldn't fit them in for time. It's in the church. Social media has allowed the outreach to any phone, to any computer, by anybody that calls themselves a pastor or calls themselves a theologian, and they're not. And these people are the ones that are teaching that the Bible, the church, Jesus Christ, that this they're reaching the next generation that those are responsible for the social and racial injustices in the world. you got to find out what your kids are listening to. What are you allowing to your home? As, much, as great as a statement as it is, love thy neighbor is not the gospel. You can still love people and never tell them the gospel and they could still go to hell. That's not the gospel. It's a great way to live but it doesn't solve their spiritual problem. A Christian that hangs around the world will eventually start talking like the world, both in speech and conduct. You'll change. 
The world has one language, and it's against God. It's why the things of God are either foolish or unreasonable to the world, and same thing with us. They are foolish or unreasonable to us, the things of the world. The spirit of the world is one against God in language. It is very rarely unified on what is right. But there is no doubt that it speaks against God. All right, moving on here. The last way uh, mentioned in text that the, that the world, that the people are one against God is in their imagination. In verse 6 it says, um, And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Nothing will be restrained from them. Now, I don't believe that God was really worried about them building a tower to heaven. Um, he's more worried about the way they think, their imaginations, their imaginations. God knows what he's dealing with in man's heart and mind. The word imagine or imagination is used 36 times in Scripture. Every single time. Every single use is connected to sin, to rebellion, or to deceit. That's what imagination or imagine is used for in Scripture. In Genesis 8, 21, it says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now listen, that's referring to the, to the descendants of Noah. That's after the flood. Only, was it, seven people were allowed through. Eight people. I don't know. Eight people. Only eight people were allowed through. I said seven. It's, like God, it's God's number. Um, but that's who, who he's referring to. Noah was a preacher of righteousness and a good man. And he, he made the statement, man's uh, imagination, his imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's talking about the people that God allowed through on the other side of the flood. It echoes with Genesis 6. Every imagination and thought of the heart was only evil continually. Proverbs 12, 20. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. Jeremiah 18, 12. And they said, there is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. And I think this one connects with Babel very well. Luke 1, 51. He hath showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. The imagination of their hearts, they were going to build the tower and the Lord scattered them in their pride. The imagination of man is only wickedness. Man is united in the mind. Man is united in imagination and it's sin against God. That's, that's what they do. That's what we do. I find it interesting that we're, we're always encouraging our kids to use their imaginations. But the only use for the imagination in the Bible is, with, is wickedness. Maybe we should be encouraging our kids to thoughtfully think about it. Maybe consider if something would please the Lord instead of using their imagination. Their unity and purpose and language gives them a boldness to declare their sin, the people here in 11. Could you imagine, again, being 100 years removed from the flood? You can talk to your grandfather and then completely reject the word of God. Could you imagine that? I guess you could. Maybe they didn't like uh, the curse that was put on them. It doesn't take long for a man to be convinced to sin. We are weak. You don't have to really work to, if you allow yourself, you really, it really doesn't take too much to convince yourself if you want something enough. When I was uh, a, a young man, I worked at a place called Cooper Vision, and we would go out on, uh, well, not we, we would go out on break and everybody would smoke. I didn't smoke, I couldn't stand the smell of it. But after a few weeks going out on break with everybody, eventually my body would just say, I want a cigarette. That sounds good. And I would go, what? Why would I want that? And I, so I, I stopped going on break and I went somewhere else. The point of it being, it doesn't take much for your body to be convinced that it wants to sin. It's there. You got to be careful. A group of people that are united in mind and purpose and language are bold through the strength in numbers. That Again, a good or a bad thing. You're going to fit in. You're going to relate to it. A lot of times, though, what I found out about fitting in in a, in a large crowd or a large situation is, is, is actually getting lost. You're allowed to get lost. We've visited churches. We've attended churches. We've been part of churches. 
that had large churches, and you could just walk in, sit wherever you wanted, sit next to somebody different every week that you've never seen in your life before, and you're going to walk out the door and you'll never see them again. There was no accountability. There was no fellowship. You never really met anybody. Nothing really mattered. I never. I don't think I even met the pastor one time. Now this tower here, this tower to heaven, was to make a name for themselves, to exalt themselves as a god. You know who else went this route? Got Isaiah fourteen twelve. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? I'm sorry, every time he he always brings up Lucifer. For thou hast said in thine heart, his imagination. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. He says, I will, I will, I will. We all know it's, it's the five I wills. I will, I will, I will. Uh, this sounds a lot here. What we have here is in verse 3. It says, let us make brick. Let us build a city. Let us make a name. They're doing the same thing. They're going to exalt themselves above the stars of God. Christians, have we gone anywhere? Do we have that fruit of the Spirit Or are we building our tower to make us a name? Lest we be scattered scattered abroad. Maybe you're scared that following the Lord is going to take you somewhere you don't want to be. I think of friends that I knew that were pillars in church. They were Sunday school teachers. Their families were excellent families. Their kids all sang and played in specials in church. They hosted cookouts for missionaries. And listen, they're no longer in church anywhere. They're no longer in fellowship. They've completely turned and rejected everything that they, that they knew. And I wonder what, you had everything going for you. Wow, how did that happen? Paul talks about uh, Demas. In his early writings, he is a fellow laborer. But later, at the end of Paul's ministry, Paul says he had forsake, Demas had forsaken him. And he having loved this present evil world. How does somebody get there? They love the present world. They found something in there that they loved that they did not want to give up. Is it any wonder that we are warned about our mind? Paul is writing to Christians and he tells us that we need to cast down the imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity Every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's something to the Bible repeating the same words over and over again. You get a lot out of that. Casting down the imaginations and bringing in the thoughts. Captivity. Are we so emboldened to build our own tower? The spirit of the world is one against God in mind. And it's one against God in its imagination. The natural mind is wicked. And its imaginations are only evil. We must renew our mind day by day. If you surround yourself with sin long enough, it will eventually corrupt your mind. It's going to corrupt you. You can't play with that fire. I often use this metaphor. It's not a very good one, but I use it. If you're going to walk on a floor with clean socks on, the floor doesn't get clean. Your socks get dirty. Eventually, If you're going to walk in the world, you're going to have to get clean somewhere. The floor doesn't become clean. So what do we have today? Well, the world stands united against God. There's no question about that. The people are one in their purpose. They're building a city. They're building their own city. They've got their own values. So what are you doing today, Christian? Are you building with mud brick or are you laying down that gold on Jesus Christ the people are one in language against God the world is united in its declaration against the things of God I don't know if you've noticed that what speech are you listening to speech is so powerful what's on your car radio 
What's on your, your TV? Are you tolerant for all? Or is it that salvation only belongs to our God? God, now listen, God divides sinners. He divides them, as we see here. But he brings the believer together in fellowship. The people are one against God in imagination. The imagination of a man's heart are only evil. We don't have any belonging in this world anymore. There, we, it's un, it should be uncomfortable for you. I can't wait for that trumpet. The two minds cannot exist in harmony. The two men, the, two, the inner man, can't exist in harmony. God will not allow it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And a lot of times people try to determine what unequally yoked means, but the, the, the passage will tell you. It says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ, concord, like a tie, hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? There isn't any. There's no fellowship, there's no communion, there's no concord, there's no part, there's no agreement between the two. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. If you want that fellowship with the Lord, if you want that fellowship with each other, you got to be separate. you got to come out from among it. You can't bring it into your house. You can't bring it in with your family. We must be completely set apart from these things. Listen, God dwells in us. We have to keep our house clean. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you uh, for this passage that you've given, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the goodness that you've shown. Thank you for the mercy and grace. I pray, God, that this can be uh, helpful for us. I pray that we can think on it, Lord, and uh, I pray you just bless your people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. That was a great message tonight. Great reminder. Uh, thinking about this uh, this Sunday with the uh, different unfruitful grounds and part of the unfruitful ground that chokes the word out is are the cares of this world and uh, you know I, I think that you've you've uh, spelled out some some good things for us to avoid and uh, that passage is one that can certainly help us learn from what these people did that did not please the Lord so Thank you for that. You brought up some great points. I appreciate that. How do you do, Mom and Dad? Okay? All right. Good. Thumbs up over there. We got to talk a little bit. We probably didn't talk enough about Lucifer, but anyway. Let's straighten them out on that. So, anyway, I thought you did a great job, Mike. Thank you very much for preaching tonight, taking time. I like your new suit. Looks good. Styling. So, but uh, yeah, don't, uh, you didn't listen. Take something home with that tonight. That's the, those are all very good points uh, of advice for us, and also some great illustrations, man. I love that. Just what's going on out there today in the world, in the church, the things we ought to be avoiding and keeping from coming in here. We all need to be on alert for some of these things, right? We got to keep our church pure. We got to keep our church godly. Uh, we got to keep it from becoming worldly and carnal and having the spirit of the world creep in here. It's done all the time today in churches. Man, I just don't, I just don't want that to happen here. So, so be, on, uh, be on alert, be on our toes for that. So it's, it's just, I appreciate it, man. It's another angle, another voice to say the same thing. So, you know, it's much appreciated. So, all right, so let's go rescue Paul, I think, has is, is, is got the kids popcorn in a movie tonight. So uh, hopefully he's probably done back there. So, We'll, uh, we'll pray, be dismissed, and, and then uh, um, you can get your children. Lord, thank you for Jesus tonight. Thank you for uh, Mike uh, bringing the word. Thank you for your study. And um, uh, 
Lord, just being thorough with the passage and uh, giving us some some good practical advice, uh, Lord, and, and, and illustrations tonight. And I just pray that you'd help us to be a good church, to be a pure church, Lord, to keep the world uh, out of our lives and out of our churches, Lord. And uh, I pray to bless our rest, the rest of our evening, this evening, our day tomorrow, and our weekend. And uh, Lord, coming back here, um, uh, Lord, in the new year, and we just pray everybody to have a good, safe New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, and then uh, be able to come back here and uh, start fresh, uh, Lord, this, this next year with uh, having communion and fellowship with one another now in Jesus' name. Amen.